as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals, presents Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. <coughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you husky! <coughs> Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Brought to you by Quaker Oats. The long journey from Selkirk northward to Dawson was one few men in the Yukon Territory cared to make during the strenuous winter season. But Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police, with his great dog Yukon King, hadn't hesitated to set out by dog sled, in spite of the hazards of cold and wind and snow and ice. Ever since the Mountie and his dog had started the trip, snow had been falling steadily. A fine, hard snow that, whipped by the wind, stung their faces and smarted their eyes. Finally, after traveling several hours, Sergeant Preston halted the dog team for a short rest. Walking! How you, Husky? Tough weather to be traveling, King, but it can't be helped. Those two cooks we're following can't be too far ahead. For several minutes, the Mountie let the dogs rest. Then, as the intense cold began to penetrate his clothing... All right, boy. There's a range of hills not too far ahead. We'll push on until we reach it and find shelter in one of the canyons there. Up front, fella. All right, on King! On, you husky! Some distance ahead of Sergeant Preston and King, Gil Dolan, a big, rough-featured man, rode the runners of the dog sled in which his partner, Jay Corey, sat. Jay was a smaller man, sharp-featured and wearing a scraggly beard that covered his face. The biting wind and severe cold penetrated the fur lap robe, and Jay, shivering under his parka, finally complained to Gil. Hey, Gil, I'm about to freeze to death. I can't go much further in this wind and icy snow. Change places with me, then. You handle the team well. The exercise will warm you up. You know doggone well I'm not good at handling the team. Then stay where you are and stop complaining. Can't blame me for the weather, you know. Uh, this range along here'd be a good place to dig in for the night. Maybe. But you know as well as I do, Preston will be on our trail with that big dog of his as soon as he hears about the bank robbery in Selkirk. He's not going to start after us in this kind of weather. You don't know Preston. He'll set out in any kind of weather. Do you think Preston got back to Selkirk from Marlowe? That looks stupid. He was due back this morning. That's why we robbed the bank last night and hit the trail away from there. I figure we'd have a good start if he didn't get back sooner than expected. If you figure we have a good start, there's no reason we shouldn't stop a while. I can't take it any longer. All right, stop the beeping. We'll stop and dig in under that ledge over to the right. Good. This weather will slow that mountain as much as it does us. We don't have to worry. Gee, gee, you have to there. At Gil's command, the dog swung off the trail to the right. And a few moments later, they reached the ledge. Gill called the team to a halt. Well, here we are, Jay. We'll dig in here and rest a while. We can see back down the trail far enough just in case that money is following. Gill and Jay settled down in sort of a natural lean-to under the ledge. A couple of hours went by. The snowfall had stopped, but the cold seemed to become more intense. Gill, who had decided to move on, stood up and took another look down the trail. The wind was blowing up trail toward him, and even before he saw the Mountie coming along on the other side of the slight ridge behind which they were hidden, Gill could faintly hear the dogs barking. Hey, Jay, somebody's coming. I hear dogs coming up the trail. Yeah, I do too. Look, Gill, there he comes. It's a Mountie, all right. He must be pressed. Yeah, in a minute he'll be within rifle range, and they'll try a shot or two. I ought to be able to pick him off before he finds out where the shot came from. In a 
ready to let him have it. King ran beside his master as Sergeant Preston drove his dog team along the trail beyond the ridge. The air was crisp. And even though the trail had become a trackless expanse of sparkling whiteness that blended into the rest of the landscape, the great dog and the Mountie unerringly followed the route that led to Dawson. Once more, the sergeant called a halt for a moment's rest. Hulking! Hurry, Hulk! Hello! We're making good time, boy. The big husky stood beside his master, waiting for the order that would start the team on the way. The wind blowing from behind them gave no warning of danger. For a few moments, Sergeant Preston stood motionless, gazing over the glaring white wasteland before them. Then, without warning, a distant rifle shot rang out. <laughs> we'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Listen, mothers and dads. With strenuous holiday activities coming on, don't feel like tired old folks. Remember, you can get more energy, more stamina from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. Yes, eat a dish of creamy, delicious hot Quaker oats tomorrow morning for the tops in life-giving protein. The kind that gives you that youthful, energetic feeling. For here's the real scientific truth about breakfast foods. University proves Quaker oats the best of all 14 leading cereals. Yes, 14 nationally known cereals, both hot and cold, of all shapes and kinds, were put to a test by a leading state university. Results were recently published in Food Research, a nationally known scientific journal. And Quaker Oats is first in life-giving protein. So treat the whole family, including yourselves, mother and dad, to creamy, delicious, hot Quaker Oats. It's the giant of the cereals in nutrition, value, and flavor. Costs less than a penny a serving and cooks in only two and a half minutes. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. Now to continue. At the mount he fell, King, startled by the sound of the shot, turned ready to streak after the one who had fired it. But he saw no one, nor could he catch any scent that would point the way to the hidden man. For a moment, the big husky growled in frustration. Then his growling changed to a whine of anxiety as he nuzzled the form of his master lying in the snow. The intelligent dog tried to arouse his master by barking. Then, as the sergeant stirred, the loyal dog whined and tugged at his sleeve. Behind the ridge, Gil and Jay watched a moment. You hit the Monty, all right, Gil. He's lying on the trail, and that dog is going nuts trying to get him up. Yeah. We'll try to pick off the mud, and then we'll go out there and make sure Pressler's done for. Wait a minute. Look, the Monty's getting to his feet. Yeah, he's staggering. I'll try another shot. Maybe this time I'll be... Hey, Gil. Yeah. He staggered back. He must have fell into the ravine that runs alongside the trail out there. Good. If he isn't already done for, that'll make it easier for us. First, I'll have to plug that crazy dog go. If he'd stop running back and forth, I'd have a better chance. Anyway, I'll try a shot at him. Sergeant Preston had staggered to his feet and had slipped and fallen into the small ravine alongside the trail. Some of the loose snow fell after him, covering his form as he lay motionless. King ran back and forth on the edge of the ravine, barking and whining. When the shot rang out and the bullet whined close, the big dog knew he too was in danger. Seemingly ready to desert his master, the intelligent husky barked to the other dogs. Then headed at a fast pace along the trail. The dog team followed with the empty sled. They disappeared around a bend. Gil and Jay saw the husky and the dog team leaving. Hey, the big dog and the husky's running away. What of it? Let him go. We'll go down there and make sure about Preston. We don't have to worry about that dog of his now. Yeah, that's right. Let's take our dog team and get gone. A short time later, the two crooks stopped their dog team near the place where Preston had fallen. Whoa there! Whoa! Whoa there! Whoa! Come on, we'll take a look. I'm with you. Yeah. 
Hey, I thought he went over about here, but I don't see him down there. Oh, neither do I. Yeah, if there was some way to get down there, I'd go look around. It was too steep and icy to get down or up. Ah, oh, what's the use? I'm getting cold again. Let's get going. He's done for now. He's down there wounded. His dogs are gone and he couldn't catch up to us. Yeah, with him out of the way, Jay, I think we'd better turn back towards Selkirk. If that dog and his dog team arrive at Elk Land in a couple of miles north of here, folks might come looking for him, huh? Say, that's right. We'll turn back and then take a branch trail around Selkirk and keep going south. All right, get on the sled and let's get started. Yeah. I'm all set. Good. Bush! Bush, you have to go. Bush! Bush! The intelligent dog king had led the dog team around the bend out of danger, where he stopped. The other dogs seemed to understand as the great husky walked slowly around them, whining. They settled in the snow as if to wait. Then King turned and started back along the trail cautiously. The big dog reached the bend in the trail, then stopped watching. He saw the two crooks leaving in the other direction. His first impulse was to chase them, but he knew they carried guns, and he felt instinctively that he should try first to find and help his master. King waited until the two men were out of sight. Then he ran back to the place where Preston had fallen into the ravine. In the ravine, Sergeant Preston, who at first had been stunned by a slight bullet crease on the temple, and again by the fall, which had been broken by the deep snowdrift below, came to under the thin blanket of snow. I, I seem to be buried in a snowdrift. Oh, my side hurts. Blood stain on the snow. I'm wounded in my side, maybe. Better find out. Dazed and temporarily out of his mind, the Mountie loosened his cartridge belt and dropped it in the snow. He unbuttoned his jacket under his pocket and felt his side. Then, buttoning his jacket, he staggered along the ravine, leaving his cartridge belt behind. King's frantic barking up on the edge of the ravine seemed to bring him back to normal. King, that's King barking. Preston, feeling slightly weak but otherwise all right, stood looking around him. He now realized where he was and looked up to see King barking and peering down at him. I'm all right, boy. I can't get out of here. Get help, King, get help. Go on, King, go to Elk Landing. Get the constable. Hurry, King, go on, boy. The intelligent husky whined a moment as he tried to understand his master. He knew instinctively human help was needed. And then the word constable seemed to register. King left the edge of the ravine and headed for Elk Landing on the run. The constable, Bill Barker, was at the trading post in Elk Landing, talking to the storekeeper and his wife. Things have been mighty quiet around here since the heavy snowfall. <laughs> Weather like this at least keeps people out of trouble, Mike. Yeah, that it does, constable. <laughs> you know, from the few people who've been in the store lately, it seems like everybody's sitting at home with their feet warm and before the fire. <laughs> yeah, that's that's right. sure a fact, Flora. Seems almost useless to open the place in weather like this. I hear a dog barking outside. Must be someone coming. See anyone out the front window, Flora? No, Mike, but I still hear that dog. I wonder if... Well, Constable, come here and look. There's a big dog barking and jumping at your office door across the street. The dog, huh? Yes, I see him. Strange that he's making... Why, Jiminy, that looks like Sergeant Preston's dog, King. Mm. King! Here, fella! Here, King! Come inside, boy. Come on. Well, King, how did you get here? Oh, and he looks like he's kind of tired out, Constable. Poor dog. I'll get him some warm food and... Running back to the door. Well, he wants to go out again. Now, what on earth is the matter with him? Wait a him? minute. Wait a minute. King, where's Sergeant Preston? Where's Sergeant Preston, boy? By golly, he seems to be trying to tell us something. You think maybe there's something the matter, Constable? Yes, I do. The way King's acting, I'd say Preston's in trouble or he needs help. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to let King out. Get my dog sled and then have him take me to Preston. Do you really think this dog can do that, Constable? Take you to the sergeant? Yes, I happen to know how intelligent King is. Oh. By thunder, I'll go with you if you want me to, Constable. Flora can look after things here till we get back. Yes. All right, Mike. Be out front in ten minutes. <laughs> All right, King, all right. We'll go with you. Let's go, fella. Come on. Hey, wait, King. Come back, boy. Come here. Come here. Easy, fella, easy. 
You'll soon be taking me to Sergeant Preston. But first, I'll get my dog King. King seemed to understand. He obediently followed the constable to the shed behind the office and stood by patiently as the constable hitched the dogs to his sled. Then, after picking up Mike, the constable spoke to the loyal husky. Now, King, find Preston. Find Preston, fella. Great day. Look at him go. We'll have to push hard to follow that dog. We'll do it. Push. Push, the husky. Push. In the ravine, Sergeant Preston walked about to keep warm. His temple throbbed with a steady pain from the bullet crease, and he used his handkerchief as a bandage to cover the crimson mark. He soon found that the ravine was unscalable and seemed to be sort of a pocket in which he was a prisoner. The cold wind whipped about him, and there was no shelter. He walked the length of the ravine and found a blank wall at one end. As he approached the other end, he saw what appeared to be a small cave. Oh, a cave? That must provide shelter until help comes, if it ever does. But as the Mountie moved cautiously toward the opening, a lean gray shape appeared in the opening. A large, hungry wolf. Instinctively, Preston's hand moved to his gun, but he withheld his fire, thinking that a shot might bring others out of the opening. He decided discretion was the better part of valor and started slowly back along the ravine. He moved up the ravine to the approximate place where he had fallen, then stopped and looked back. The gray, sinister figure had moved after him and squatted on its haunches, almost out of gun range. If there were others, they'd have come out by now. I'll risk a shot. And missed. He's wise enough to keep far enough away. At least he did move back, but he's sitting again, watching and waiting. That opening. The presence of that wolf in the ravine may mean the opening leads out of here. If I met him, I'll try to find out. I move closer again, closer than before. I'll try another shot. Got him. I'll go make sure he's done the hornet. Two more down near the cave. The Mountie watched as two more slinking gray shapes moved cautiously forward. They're moving closer. At the sound of the shots, the two wolves merely sat down out of range as if waiting. Preston never took his eyes from them, knowing how swiftly wolves could move in. He started to walk slowly back, and then noticed that they were stalking him, moving slowly, seemingly judging his pace. Then, becoming bolder, the wolves moved closer. Preston stopped and took aim. Have to keep them back. One of the wolves fell, but the other ran back a short distance and stopped. Preston pulled the trigger again. Empty. I better reload in a hurry. Preston removed his gloves and reached under his pocket to get more bullets from his cartridge belt. Well, my cartridge belt's gone. I must have unbuckled it while I was still in the daze at the spot where I fell in the ravine. Must be around here someplace. Preston searched hurriedly in the deep snow for his cartridge belt, but couldn't locate it. I'll never find it in these snowdrifts. As he realized his predicament, Preston glanced up. Another gray shape stood near the opening. He was without ammunition, and he knew it would only be a matter of time before the hungry wolves sensed the situation and moved in with their fangs of death. A chill ran down the Mountie's spine as he thought of what he had to face. His lips moved in a silent prayer as he stood waiting and watching. Finally, the gray figures began to move forward slowly, cautiously. For a moment, Preston looked around wildly for something to use as a weapon, but found nothing. Then, grasping the barrel of his gun, he stood ready to go down fighting to the last breath. Come on, I'm ready for you. But as the wolves moved near, a welcome sound broke upon the Mountie's ears. King! King! Preston, we're up here. The constable and Mike, shooting from the edge of the ravine, killed another of the wolves and sent the last one scurrying for the cave. We'll cross your rope and have you out of there in a jiffy, Sergeant. Within a short time, the constable and Mike had pulled Sergeant Preston up beside them. The Mountie stood a moment to regain his composure as he patted King. Good boy, King. If you hadn't brought the constable... By Jiminy, Sergeant, King is almost human. We found your dog team down the trail. The dogs were buried in the snow. Good. I was afraid the cooks had taken them. Crooks? Yes, two of them. They ambushed me. See there? 
The track showed they came here, then turned back and went towards Selkirk. While I was still dazed, I must have unbuckled my cartridge belt and dropped it in a drift. I couldn't find it, and my gun's empty. You hadn't come along when you did. I'm glad we did, Sergeant. What happened anyway? I noticed you have a handkerchief on your head. Briefly, Sergeant Preston related the details of what he remembered. When he had finished, Mike said, Well, you and King better come back with us and rest up, Sergeant. You both have been through a lot. No time for that, Mike. We're turning back and going after those two cooks. Very well, I'll go with you. Mike, you'd better take my team and go back to Elk Landing. Just as you say. I sure hope you catch those dirty killers, Sergeant. So do I, Mike. They thought they left me for dead in that ravine. Well, so long. I leave you now. Mike! Sergeant, for the time being, you ride the sled and I'll drive. All right, Constable. Up front, King. <laughs> All right. On King! On, you hussy! We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. And now, here he is, that famous teller of tall tales, none other than your old friend, Gabby Hayes. Talk about adventures in the Yukon, fellas and girls. Why, I just shiver when I think of the first time I went looking for gold years ago. But what I found was a ferocious polar bear. Somehow, I got up into the polar bear country. One bright sunny morning when I was fixing breakfast, I suddenly looked up. And bearing down on me was the hugest polar bear I ever seen. Well, sir, first thing I done was eat a big bowl of nourishing hot Quaker oats, the giant of the cereals. Why, you get more strength and more energy from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. And giant power, why, that's what Quaker oats poured into me. You're darn tootin'. So I tackled that polar bear with my bare hands. I fought him off with one hand, and with the other, I grabbed my shiny new prospecting pan, and I let the sun reflect off it right into his eyes. And can you believe it? That polar bear was so blinded, you'd have thought he was playing blind man's buff. Yes, sir Bob. And now say, you fellas and girls want to know how the giant of the cereals can help you too, the way it does, old Gabby? Well, then start eating Quaker oats. Treat yourself every morning from now on to a heap and bowl of creamy, delicious Quaker oats. Or make it mother's oats. Because shucks, they're just exactly the same. Now to continue. Gil Nolan and Jay Corey had moved along the trail towards Selkirk for some distance. As dusk approached, snow began to fall again. The wind blew with greater intensity, so that traveling became even more difficult. Oh, there, boy, oh, there. Hey, Gil, we better find some place to hold up for a while. This is turning into a blizzard. Yeah, I reckon you're right, Jay. We aren't far from that deserted cabin we passed when we were going the other way this morning. And let's go there and put up for the night. Nobody will find that Mountie's body, even if they do find his dogs. They aren't going to know about us. Yeah, it's true. We'll move on till we reach that cabin. Push! 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 Before long, the two crooks reached the cabin. They had some supplies with them and soon had a fire going in the pot-bellied stove. As they settled down in chairs before the fire, after having hot coffee, they felt snug and secure. <laughs> Well, Jay, luck is with us, it seems like. We'll stay here till the storm lets up. Preston is either lying dead and buried in the snow in that ravine, or he's injured and can't get out. <laughs> We're safe enough. You know, I heard a lot about that dog of Preston. <laughs> Believe me, he acted like any other scared mutt when he heard those <laughs> bullets whine near him. He sure let out along the trail with the dog team at his heels. Yeah. If anyone finds him, they wouldn't know where to look for Preston's body. <laughs> Not unless that mud of his is able to talk him. And this new snowfall will cover our tracks, even if someone did get wise and try to follow. That's right. We have nothing to worry about. 
The bank cash and that carpet bag on the table will pay our way for a mighty long time. There's 10000 there. 5000 each. Uh, I'm going to turn in on that cot over there and get some sleep. You better do the same. Yeah, that's a good idea. <sighs> Maybe by morning the storm will be over. Wait! Hold hey, the bill! Holy mackerel, I'm happy. Two of them! That's Sergeant Preston. I thought he was... Don't a... you kill me, eh? I'll kill that dirty red coat right now. Fire! Oh, I'm hit! Has killed two to fire at Preston. Jay jumped behind the big stove near which he'd been standing. Drop your guns, both of you. Get out from behind that stove. During the initial excitement, the great dog King had slipped unnoticed from behind the two Mounties and moved like a streak in the shadows along the wall. He was opposite Jay when Preston's bullet hit the stove. And as the crook pointed his gun over the top of the stove to fire, the mighty husky sprang with a snarl. Jay's bullet went wild as he fell under the impact of King's attack. Take him off! Help! Stop him! Okay, done, fellow. Watch him, boy. Pick up the guns, Constable. All right. I have him. You, you were in the ravine with a bullet in you. I don't know how that you... That bullet could... creased my temple, that's all. You men forgot about my dog, King. It's because of him that I'm here now. Yeah, I knew we should have plucked that darn but King was too smart for you from all appearances. Constable, here's the bank cash in this carpet bag. The bands around the bills are stamped with the name of the Selkirk First National. Fine, fine. I had too many, Sergeant. No matter what you go through to do it, you always get your man. We all have that reputation, Constable. Don't forget, you helped get these crooks. It was your understanding of King that saved my life. King really proved his worth on this occasion, Sergeant. He's proved his worth many times in the past. All right, you two. We arrest you in the name of the Crown for armed robbery and attempted murder. Hey, Thunder, I wish that bullet had hit you a bit closer. Gil, if you weren't wounded, I'd break your neck for what you tried to do to me. No, my arm. Let go. Get away from me. I'd say it's lucky for him he is wounded. We'll fix his wound. Untie them and get them to Selkirk, Constable. I admit I'll not forget for a long time the experience I went through today. But at least with them behind bars, I'll be ready to say this case is closed. Sergeant Preston will return in just a moment with a word about our next exciting adventure. Hello, folks. This is your friend, Aunt Jemima. Do your children like extra light pancakes? Then for supper tonight, just add milk to my Aunt Jemima pancake or buckwheat mix and bake the lightest pancakes ever. And the only pancakes with that good old South flavor. Fluffy, golden, feather light Aunt Jemima pancakes. Good for breakfast, lunch, or <laughs> supper tonight. Mm-hmm. And now, here is Sergeant Preston. Sergeant Preston reporting for duty, Inspector. Sergeant, the young constable at Selkirk, Denny Carter, is trailing the notorious murderer, Lefty Nash. Denny trailing Nash? Could I go after them, sir? Yes, immediately. We can't let Denny face Lefty Nash, and you know why, Sergeant. The inspector and Sergeant Preston are both concerned about Denny Carter going after the killer, Lefty Nash. Why must the young Mountie be prevented from meeting Nash? And can Preston reach him in time? Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of Sergeant Preston of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. Sergeant Preston of the Yukon is brought to you every Sunday at the same time by Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Oats, the giant of the cereals. So long. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.